Welcome <clears throat> to Coronavirus and Mental Health. Today is March 2nd, and we're coming to you from, well, I'm coming to you from Haleiwa, Hawaii. And well, today is another day of the pandemic uh, of coronavirus. Uh, now the cases are plunging and uh, uh, some restrictions are loosening and it's all happening too fast and too slow for most people. The statistics from the New York Times indicate that uh, our numbers are down from over 4,200 last in, well, not last month, but in January. And that was a two week uh, indication in, in late January, down to in the 120s uh, from yesterday for our two week uh, average. And with the actual count yesterday with only at 117 new cases. So things are changing rapidly and we're gonna talk about that today. And we're also going to talk about the effects that the developing situation in Ukraine may have on people here in the United States and people around the world. Today, I'm very fortunate to have my good friend and therapist extraordinary, Daniel Lev, and he's going to tell us uh, what's happening. He's just now come to us from being with a client and after we talk today, he'll be going back to his client load, <clears throat> which is extensive as it has been in the coronavirus uh, era that we've been going through in the last two years. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna start off by asking uh, you, Daniel, uh, when you look at your caseload for the past two years that the coronavirus has been mm -hmm. altering our lives, what changes have you seen in your clients as far as problems and needs and everything? and uh, your sort of your perspective on the whole coronavirus uh, period well like any other stressful situation it magnifies what a person's going through some people just see me because they're stressed out about coronavirus but if they had a pre-existing anxiety problem it of course becomes worse because this is yet another issue that is that is worrying them so I've definitely seen that. And you're right as far as being busy. And I'm not the only one. A lot of therapists are noticing that we're having to put people on waiting lists because we're so full. And I see about mm, between 20 and 28 people a week individually, um, primarily adults. So it's, it's very busying. And a lot of problems, yes, have been exacerbated. I've noticed compared to the years before this. If we take a look at that, uh... <clears throat> to and compare it to recent events with the anxiety about Russia and Ukraine and what's happening there, the threat of war that's now transitioned into actual fighting and uh, people dying and uh, lives being upset and great fear spreading across the planet as to how far this war is gonna go. How many people are gonna be involved? Are we gonna be in another war and what kind of war are we going to be in? Now, right now, everybody I'm sure is exhausted from dealing with the coronavirus. Uh, this stress for two years that we've been undergoing, all the changes in our lives have been <sighs> immense. Now in wartime, that the same thing happens. Very similar things happen. We get uh, cut off from our family members. We look at the world and see how powerless we can be and how little maybe we can make an impression or an impact on what's going on globally. All these things mount up and now they're coming in right on top of the coronavirus. So it seems like we're doubling down in problems. Um, during the last month, while all of this has been developing, have you seen changes in the last month in your clients as far as anything that's been associated with this developing global uh, crisis? Again, I'm just one therapist, but I really haven't seen anything just yet um, that is any different than before, even the buildup uh, of the Russian troops on the Ukrainian border. Um, and that's fortunate, but I'm sure that over time, uh, as this may affect us economically or otherwise, they may start uh, feeling more the pinch of this experience. Well, let's, let's talk about war in general, because we just, 
retreated from a forever war, being in Afghanistan and uh, in Iraq. And the country is tired and people are tired. Uh, it just seems to be with us forever. And we seem to be in this crisis mode forever. Now for the last two years, we've been in the same crisis mode only under coronavirus where things go up and they come down and they look better and then they look worse. Mm -hmm. And war is also like that. Uh, the rapid changes and uh, the feelings of hopelessness from a lot of people. Let, let's, let's go back to uh, you know, our forever war. What did you see when you were dealing with your clients under those war conditions? And how do we deal with stuff like that? Well, definitely people were, uh, had a heightened level of anxiety about you know, when are our soldiers coming back and, and what are we doing there and things of that sort. Um, but uh, if we look at now, uh, the few people that did talk with me about Russia uh, and the Ukraine expressed a sense of relief that we're not going back to the Afghanistan, Iraq uh, situation that actually uh, we're not going to have to send soldiers there. And they felt relieved about that. Uh, it wasn't a huge issue on their mind, but uh, a few folks that did talk about that did experience that. And as far as during Iraq and, and in Afghanistan, well, certainly a lot of the people I work with are soldiers. I work with a number of folks who are either veterans or active duty soldiers um, and absolutely affected them, as you might imagine, uh, uh, in forms of PTSD or other kinds of issues um, that being in a, in a battle, being in a war zone will, will create for someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about that for a second because last night our president got on television and radio and broadcast to everybody. And his agenda seemed to have radically changed in the last couple of days <clears throat> from his, you know, things that he was trumpeting before, you know, uh, money for the, uh, you know, for the environment, uh, for, you know, for causes that we need to deal with here in the country. And all of a sudden he's talking a lot about Russia and, uh, you know, the Ukraine. And so things are happening at such a rapid rate that even those of us who think, well, we're so far away from this, mm -hmm. um, you know, it can't affect us. Well, we've been through that before. We tried that sort of in World War II, and then all of a sudden Pearl Harbor came to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we who thought we could stay back from all this were not. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden we were right in the middle of things. And if this spreads out to other countries in Europe, especially those with NATO, this is going to change again rapidly, and uh, every day seems to bring uh, more pressures uh, to bear on us. Actually, one of the things he talked about, which very much bears on this uh, with some of my clients, is the concern about democracy and yeah. how there are larger groups, which used to be more on the fringe, that you know would create a January 6th insurrection kind of situation. So I, I find some of my clients were kind of insecure about how solid will this democracy be? I think right now, at least after hearing uh, the State of the Union and seeing Republicans and Democrats clapping, that may have given people some hope that there will be some level of unity because the, the, um, the split amongst these various populations, liberal, conservative, and others, uh, is uh, is was perceived by a number of my clients and myself included as as a dangerous lean back to what happened in the 30s, and so uh, you know I've worked with them again to help help them deal with the anxiety, deal with the depression, and not overly uh, focus on these things. But it's hard when it's in the news and it's there all the time. Let's let's talk about that split for a minute because you know what we're seeing is you know when. When all those coronavirus positives come down and the hospital uh, you know, admissions are going down and our, even our death rate here in Hawaii is now down, um, we, we expect people to feel a lot better than they are. And right now, I still see a lot of division. I see if, you know, like with the loosening of our restrictions as far as uh, you know, where we can eat when we have to mask and our vaccinations 
And uh, the governor is going to be ruling on the 25th of this month on our safe travel uh, health restrictions. So these are things uh, that's going to make gr great changes here in Hawaii. But for many people, this is going way too fast. And we're saying, you're jumping on the bandwagon here, and this still may be dangerous. And uh, I'm not comfortable with uh, this loosening going so fast. Other people are saying it's way been way too slow, that uh, people are dragging their heels. Uh, it's all these people who are, you know, paranoid, et cetera, who's keeping us back. We should be full on, you know, open about this so our economy can get back to its, you know, its healthy self. Um, and like you're saying, there are still groups of people, even here in Hawaii, that are saying, you know, uh, no, no, this is not the way to go. Uh, and our government is not leading us in the right direction. Uh, so the split uh, is very real and people still seem to be angry and they still seem to be afraid and unsure uh, of what's gonna happen. And are, are those some of the things you're also seeing in your clients? Yeah, well, you know, people I see are like everybody else. They have certain problems they want to work with me on. But so I see the polarization there too. There are some that think the vaccination is dangerous or various conspiracy ideas. Other people are were angry at the previous president and, and government for not taking COVID as seriously as they felt it should have been taken. So there's definitely a bifurcation of these, these approaches. Um, Again, when I'm working with them, yeah, they may express some of these things. I can see some of these things, but we try to work on helping lower the stress that comes from them, okay? Because that's part of the problem. A good deal of the problem is people can think about certain issues that happen, but the stress level goes up, and then whatever psychological problem they've been dealing with, that becomes exacerbated. So even though there are two groups, so to speak, I treat them as one group of people who are all dealing with a similar thing, and that is stress related to COVID, related to political polarization, and now related to uh, uh, a level of engagement in war that makes them somewhat nervous, but at least many of them uh, feel more comfortable that we're not sending soldiers. But still, it, it raises stress. So that's my job, to work with them and finding a way to be calm. My job is not to argue with them about what the right position is, obviously, but to help them um, get back to a, a level of, of life that is more comfortable for them. Terrific. Thank, thank you for bringing that up, because that's where I want, I'm hoping this program will go. Uh, what we've been talking about is the problems that are coming with uh, coronavirus and this threat of war. But... What this program really is about and what we hope to communicate to everybody today is how do we deal with this? How do we help people with these problems? And uh, I know that's your strength, Daniel. And so uh, let's talk about some particulars of how you relieve those that stress with your clients and what the people who are watching this program can do to make themselves feel better and less stressed out and less worried and less polarized. Oh, you want me to tell the secrets of psychotherapy all in 10 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Truly. Well, again, every therapist works differently. I'm more in the here and now. So just trying to look at what's happening in their life right now. What are some things that they can do now? But also to, to be ears and to really listen to what they're wanting to express and talk about. Um, and I use a lot of humor, uh, but I also will work with people on engaging in practices, again, that calm one down. Because see, you can calm down. It doesn't mean you're forgetting about the issue you're very passionate about, but you can think about it more clearly and without it uh, um, making you feel upset later or without upsetting people around you necessarily. So another group of skills I work with people on is uh, what I call refocusing skills. Because uh, a lot of the problems, let's say, with depression uh, you know, uh, and you, I think you mentioned in this, this to me a while back, a person who's depressed, because, and I have several people who have lost someone to COVID. So they're, you know, they're going through mourning and, and some of that is leaking into more of a depressive kind of thing where they feel bad about themselves and not just missing the person. And so I'll work with them on ways to, as best they can, move away 
from some of the thinking if it becomes way too much, if they, if they need to cope better with it. And so refocusing skills are like meditation, relaxation, uh, some clinical hypnosis, mm -hmm. things of that sort to help them redirect their attention because it's about the attention. If we keep our attention on things that are upsetting, it will upset us. And so that's just one one thing that I will do along with a lot of humor and other things to, to suggest to people or work with them, or even just notice what they're already naturally doing. Let, uh, let's talk about refocusing for a second, because <clears throat> that and all the techniques that you talked about, I've used in my practice. Uh, the problem I find with refocusing is that people can refocus for a minute, two minutes, three minutes, and all of a sudden something like the cat yowling, <laughs> or, you know, or something outside, all of a sudden breaks that refocus. And the uh, bad things come rushing in, the bad feelings, the bad thoughts, and all of a sudden they're back in that pit. Right. Um, and it's sort of easy to say to refocus and to try to help them, but uh, to get that to become sort of automatic or sort of long-term refocusing, uh, that's always been the challenge. And I was wondering how you how you dealt with people who come to you and say, you know, that worked well for a little bit and then I got lost again. <laughs> it's a very common misunderstanding. When I say refocusing, I'm not talking about the result. Ah, okay. Okay, I'm talking about a practice. So when you're driving a car, you're not 100% focused, but mm -hmm. you've done it so long that you're not going to be in a crash, you know, God forbid. Uh, the odds are you'll drive safely, you'll be okay, all right? It's a skill like anything else, you have to practice it. So when I'm sitting, like you said, and I feel, let's say I'm just focusing on my breath going in and out and suddenly I think, God, what's for lunch? Okay, <laughs> so that's a distraction, it's normal. When mm -hmm. I'm distracted, all I need to do or what I need to do is just refocus back on the breath. That's why I call it refocusing. Quickly, three things you do, let's say with meditation. Number one, you let go and relax. So I'm sitting, in a seat, I'm letting go of the thoughts. I'm letting them come and go. I'm not purposely thinking them. Number two, I focus on something, something neutral or positive, a piece of music, my breath going in and out of my belly, watching the waves at the beach, whatever it is. And number three, every time I get distracted, which you will, because we have brains and that's what brains do, we will think about things. We will focus on other things. When we get distracted and you notice you're distracted, you just reel yourself back to focus. That's the practice. You're always going, you're never going to keep it there all the time. But as you do this, like driving, you become so good, you'll be able to keep it focused longer. And then that has all kinds of health benefits, physical health benefits, as well as psychological health benefits when you do that, including stress relief. Well put. I, you know, I appreciate that because that's some of the things that I use too. In addition to those techniques, I also used uh, cues. Uh, if people were having a particular problem uh, and falling away from that refocusing, that re uh, thinking in a different direction, uh, I oftentimes had them wear something that was easily visible. Maybe it was a red paper ring or something. And as they're just going, uh, falling into that pit and they look down and see that ring or they see something on their collar or something, if they're looking in a mirror, anything that's in their line of vision that says, well, stop what you're doing. Let's refocus. Let's get back to relaxing and doing all those things that Daniel told us about. So, yeah. Uh, so, absolutely. In fact, you could think that even if you say, I am dedicated to doing these things, we forget all the time. So that cue is a reminder. Yeah. Uh, one form of mindfulness meditation or called thought labeling is, Let's say I'm focusing on my breath, and when I get distracted, I label it in my mind. Oh, thought, and then I come back to focus. Well, I put it's like putting a flashing red sign on whatever distracts me, because usually it's the same darn thing that distracts me. And so I put that flashing red sign on, and next time it tries to distract me, I get back faster. So the cue that you're mentioning does the same thing on their body. It reminds them, oh, yeah, I can do this now. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's, uh, it, let's carry this a little bit further and go to relationships. Uh -oh. uh, because <clears throat> some of our relationships, the people we're living with can be a tremendous help, you know, as far as refocusing and relaxing in that. And when we start falling into that depressive or anxious pit, 
our partner, our wife, our husband, or whoever, our son, our daughter, can turn to us and say, refocus, refocus. You're losing it. You know, just relax. Everything is okay. I'm here with you, etc. cetera. Uh, and so uh, if you could talk a little bit about how to draw those people uh, that they're in relationships with now, that they may be living with now, and also uh, say a little bit about what you can do for people who are living alone, uh, either by choice or because of the pandemic, who have been separated from the people they're used to being with. All those are things that uh, I would love to hear uh, your thoughts on. And I appreciate you asking. I know you know a lot of these things. Um, <laughs> well, first, in a relationship, uh, uh, to brag for a half a second, my wife and I live in our apartment, and we love it. <laughs> we actually like seeing each other all the time. But some couples, they need more break. They need more space. So finding ways to give each other more space, okay, without thinking, oh, I'm being rejected or, or I'm wrong or anything, that's really big for the couple to sit down and say, okay, let's just acknowledge I need not to see you as much, okay? And then they find a way, you know, if they have a small place, they find a way uh, to, to give each other that space. Uh, certainly if they come into argument space and they want to try to stay away from that, uh, similar idea is a cue, uh, a, a timeout word. They make this up before it happens. And if either of them feel uncomfortable in a conversation, they just say, lamb chops. I mean, whatever the word is, Sometimes <laughs> the funnier the word, the better. Scrambled mm -hmm. eggs. I've had clients do that. And that's a signal to stop talking, turn around, walk away from each other, go do something to cool out. So that's just a nice interrupter if, if the couple can do that. Being alone, I have a number of clients who really feel this. This is where the pandemic really hit a lot of folks is they're afraid, of course, to be around too many people. But I work with them to encourage them in safe ways to be around people. But but look, when I'm seeing them, I'm seeing you on Zoom, God's gift to, to the pandemic, okay? That we actually can talk. It's almost like they're in the room, all right? Especially if we are relating like you and I are relating. So uh, finding ways to connect with groups. Uh, I, I often suggest meet up is one way to, to find groups of people that have similar interests. And a lot of them are online uh, or church groups or whatever it is to meet people that way. Terrific. Um, <clears throat> we had a question, Daniel, that just came in uh, from one of our uh, viewers and talks about how we feel about a new variant coming in. I mean, we've seen the original COVID come in and then it was replaced by Delta, you know, a much more uh, scary variant. And then all of a sudden Omicron comes in and one that is so widespread and so contagious that uh, our numbers just start skying out of sight. Mm -hmm. And uh, this viewer wanted to know about uh, how we deal with or how we help people who are worried about the next variant coming in and thinking to themselves, there's this big cloud, dark cloud that's gonna come over us with another variant. Ah. And how do we deal with yeah, this? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Again, I don't have all the answers. But one answer that, that one great psychologist, Richard Lazarus, would say when they asked him what to do, he would always say, it depends. <laughs> For some people who can handle learning, they should check with the CDC, check the actual information and not the scary ideas about information. Mm -hmm. For some people, that can be helpful. Okay. For other people... Uh, sometimes just to stop thinking about it a little bit, which is easy for me to say, but to redirect their attention away from overly focusing on it, but just enough to stay safe, but check in with the facts once in a while to know that Omicron spread like crazy, but it was apparently less lethal for people with, with um, vaccinations and boostings. And so uh, to do things to make sure you're safe uh, would be, again a simple way to handle that and it just you know, it's a wait and see thing it, it is hard to predict how what we're going to do yeah it's very hard uh it's very hard to put yourself in that person's position and uh it's one of the very great difficulties that uh, we as therapists have dealing with uh, our clients yeah on the other hand it's also very hard for us to deal with it too because like you said most everybody is overwhelmed including therapist and uh, physical and mental health 
people who are working sort of round the clock to try to deal with all this. So it's very difficult. And I know we're coming uh, to the end. Just to, uh, let me invite people, take a few minutes, up to 10, 15, 20 if you can, to sit quietly and just focus on something pleasant and keep your mind there as best you can. That will help with this. Yeah, absolutely. If we, you know, uh, <clears throat> Daniel, we're running a little short. We're coming down uh, to the three minute mark. So any last words, any last things that you would like to send to people out in the audience to give them some idea of uh, additional stuff that they could do to help themselves through this, what seems like a never ending crisis. Absolutely, uh, very quickly, like I just said, give yourself a calming practice of some kind, even if you walk in a beautiful place, whatever it is, and redirect your mind just to where you are and away from all of the tumult of the news. Some people, Staying away from the news is going to be helpful more often than not. And certainly, if you are feeling a great deal of suffering over this, it would be very helpful if you don't already consult a therapist to check out a therapist. Uh, they can be very helpful in, in, helpful in, in, in helping you find a way to better cope if you're finding you're overwhelmed. But doing that would be helpful. Thank you for mentioning that, because that's something that I think is very important. This program is not a therapy session. We can't be your therapist. We can only come on and give you some ideas and try to help with all the things that we're facing, both our thoughts and our emotions. And so I really appreciate you uh, you saying that, Daniel. And I appreciate you being on the program <clears throat> and sharing your experience with us. It's been very helpful. Uh, we've tried to, in this session, focus on uh, sort of the breaking news of the potential of war, the focusing on... Uh, Russia and the Ukraine, all the anxiety that that brings to the table, along with coronavirus. Uh, in two weeks, uh, we'll be checking and seeing how this scenario is playing out, but we'll also be probably going back to where we'd hope to be today and talking about uh, coronavirus and uh, grieving and uh, feelings of loss, which we mentioned, just, which Daniel mentioned just a little briefly today. Uh, we'll go into that in more in depth too. But we'll be staying on top of what's happening with the coronavirus and what's happening in the world. And we really appreciate your questions. Anything that you're worried about or concerned about, please uh, email us or check in with us during the session. Uh, and we'll try to answer everything that you, you ask because we want to know where you're at, not simply what uh, we feel everybody's at. We want to know from you. So thank you very much for everybody listening in. And again, thank you, Daniel, for coming. I know you're busy today with all your clients, and I really appreciate you taking the time to join us. It was a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.